not look great. Dig it. All right. The title of an essay I just wrote. You wrote an essay? Yeah, a personal essay it's about my experience and journey through grief. What? Is it up online yet? I'm trying to find a place to publish it. But okay. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Nice. Can I read it? I can send it to you. Yeah. I was thinking about that and getting ready for this. I wanted to like read some of your work mm. to like be able to introduce you right, more properly. Sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I never told, did I tell you that um, uh, my first published piece is going to appear in Analog Magazine, which is like the oldest sci-fi magazine in America. What? And like Isaac Asimov has been published in there. So not Incredible. Not to like boast or anything, but no, it's, it's, a, it's a piece called Enter the Fungusine, which is about humans who are clones. They're all clones, but they're like part of this geoengineering project way in the future when the Earth is spun wildly out of climatic control. Uh-huh. climactic control, whatever, and uh, and they're trying to re-engineer the Earth back to the Holocene. Huh. But meanwhile, what is the Holocene? The Holocene is the period of climatic stability that we are currently living in. We're in the Holocene right yeah. now. Yeah. What is the Anthropocene? The Anthropocene that you is talk a newer about? term. Uh-huh. That uh, I mean, I'm not an expert, obviously, but like it has to do with ge- geologists and certain people identifying how humans how are now having such a massive impact on the earth uh-huh. that it can be seen in the geologic rep- record oh, so it can be okay. seen as like one of the epochs you know the anthropocene the holocene whatever um okay so the anthropocene yeah. is kind of after the holocene yeah. in a way but they're kind of blending together too it sounds like it's not like yeah. a definitive there's an argument about whether date. it actually is an epoch whether it'll actually appear in the geologic record there's some evidence saying that like nothing we could possibly create would would ever even appear because like that's Geologic kind of, time is so like massive, you know. Interesting. And our human civilization is so temporary. That's almost like a climate change denial argument in a way. Hmm. That like humans can't have any kind of impact on, on large scale. Well, but, it's more like on geologic record, not like climate. Climate's oh, like kind of okay. separate from geology. Okay. Um. But anyways, my story, Fungusine, is about instead like humans are trying to re-engineer the Earth back to the Holocene, but instead mm-hmm. Earth is like evolving in weird and wild ways and now fungus are like the prominent like life form and there's like giant wow. 30 foot or 40 foot fungi and like forests of fungi and weird creatures and so they're trying to like kind of uh, adapt and cope with this weird new world and direction that the earth is going in. so did they actually make it did they turn it back into the holocene they're trying unsuccessfully to do that and, and, and the, the more that they're trying the more weirdly and wildly the earth is like veering out of their control so it's just like playing with these themes of like humans trying to technologically control the earth while the earth is just doing its own damn thing like whatever Uh it wants and like evolving new species that humans aren't like ready and capable of adapting to dude i love that yeah i love that those giant mushroom imagery (laughs) well there's in the the geology yeah in the geologic record there they found that there are these there was a period in Earth's history where there were these giant mushrooms. Uh huh. They were actually like thirty-foot mushrooms. And that's where trees. I got the idea for the story. Right on. There's also like and trees were cells. like yeah that big at the time. Really? Oh, so trees were really small. Yeah. Huh, I've never heard that part. Okay, I know of like the horsetail. Those like little. We're all just like conjecturing here. Right, right. Those horsetails that grow like in the seeps mm-hmm. though. You've probably seen that plant before. Yeah. They apparently used to be like giant. Oh really? Giant oh. trees basically back in the day. They're from prehistoric times they've, yeah. they've evolved for a really long time with us yeah the earth is weird it is the earth is weird it is weird and i think we tend to forget that living in our culture that uh-huh. like kind of yeah we're, we're out of touch with it you know that weirdness and wildness yeah exactly <laughs> so this is what good grief network is all about for <laughs> a smooth transition here um <laughs> little intro <laughs> that's that's what we're here to talk about today the Good Grief Network. I don't know if anyone's on this live at all, but either way. Um, yeah, curious to hear about that. We definitely got to get into that. Um, what is, like, so you've been doing Good Grief Network for basically two years so far? You guys yeah, have done two exactly. iterations of yeah. it? Is that um, right? I've facilitated, I'm in my second round of facilitating two. 
I'm, this is my second round of being a facilitator. Yeah, yeah. And I participated in two rounds of it before. Got you. And uh, I guess I could just briefly explain what it is. Good Grief Network is a place where people can come and um, sit with others and try to process their grief at the systems collapse that we're experiencing or their perception of the collapse that we're experiencing, climate change and everything from climate change to like rise of authoritarian regimes around the world to, um, you know, this the oppressive uh, systems that we're living within. Um, and uh, it's modeled after the AA's 12 step program. Uh -huh. So there's 10 steps and uh, I can't rattle them off the top of my head, but we work week by week to kind of sit and try to sit in circle mm -hmm. and work through our feelings that come up with each of these steps. Right. And the first of the steps, for example, is um, accept the severity of the predicament. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge one to start with because the predicament is like everywhere and everything, every aspect of this world devouring machine that we are part of. Yeah. Um, but for me, actually, every step is about accepting the severity of the predicament. There's even a step about gratitude, you mm -hmm. know, and that tends to be the most heavy step a lot of times because people Why have is that? people have a lot of ch are really challenged to like feel gratitude in a world that feels like it's coming apart. Interesting. You know? People yeah. are yeah okay, yeah people are challenged to feel gratitude in a world that's coming apart. Yeah. But that's a big part of the medicine to be able yeah. to see it as part of the yeah. process and yeah. the unfolding that's happened. Yeah. And maybe even that, like, humans, I don't know, I speculate about this stuff a lot, that maybe, like, this is supposed to be unraveling the way it is. Mm. That maybe there's some kind of greater intelligence going on, mm. that, like, even though there's things that seem really evil or really challenging or really destructive, mm. that perhaps that stuff has to happen in order for, like, a greater good to come about on the earth. Mm. Yeah. That's things that I'm speculating on. Yeah, I thought about a lot about that recently, too, and how it seems like the worst se things seem to get at the same time the vision of how much better they could be becomes clearer yeah you know now permaculture is just like widely not widely known but like it's it's in the cultural milieu you know you have farms totally. like or sorry farms movies like um, little biggest little farm right yeah and how awesome. it's just like why can't we have a civilization that's based on this kind of agricultural model or this relationship with nature totally each other you know it could be that that would be like a much more beautiful way to live than what we have now which is just extractive and oppressive in so many ways exactly that's the joe rogan i should recommend to you the joel oh. salatin one when he's on there joel salatin you know of him He's like a regenerative farmer in the oh, Shenandoah cool. Valley of Virginia. Uh, He's like the most successful permaculture farmer probably in the world. Like, huh. as far as just like massive land regeneration and also oh, making wow. an income off of it and wow. doing really amazing things with regenerative um, animal husbandry and all that stuff. Mm. And uh, he was on Joe Rogan recently talking about a lot of those concepts. Mm. The word permaculture came up on that podcast like twice in a week. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's interesting that that's getting into the collective milieu now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because like that, it's still pretty underground. Yeah. And it's it's known about in certain circles very like prolifically. Mm. But I wouldn't say that the average person knows what that term is or knows what that concept right. is necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it, of course, comes from like these indigenous traditions in mm -hmm. a way. It's like a it's an offshoot of those things. Yeah. Um, point is pointing back to those things. Some of those things that are still in they're still happening mm -hmm. um they haven't necessarily had as much of a broken lineage mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is like an old it's, it's a system pointing back to something much older um but yeah it was just cool to hear that on that mm. podcast and be like oh shout out dude <laughs> <laughs> shout out to what we're doing yeah yeah how did you get into that kind of stuff um well for me it was a very personal journey and i was just at some point i realized that what i was experiencing was grief or what uh -huh. I wanted to be, the way that I needed to process what I was experiencing was grief. Mm -hmm. I'd experienced like depression and anxiety for many years that I think came from actually the pushing away of my emotions. Mm -hmm. and I have this concept now, this idea now, that uh, depression is not actually sadness. Depression is pushing away these depths of feelings, trying to actually manage our emotions and mm. not let them move through us in a way that would be natural and healthy and allow us to adapt to the different ways and directions that our life and the world is taking us. Um, but I didn't have the, those tools to be able to do that when I 
was first starting to kind of like learn about how dire the situation we're in now, like learning about the uh, feedback loops of climate change, yeah. you know, um, the fires triggering more CO2 in the atmosphere, which makes the weather hotter, which makes more, which means more fires, yeah, yeah. which means more CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, and there's countless feedback loops like that that have already been triggered mm -hmm. that are causing our world beyond our cultural, narrow human culture to spiral out of control. Yeah. So I was coming to terms with the realization that this is happening and what can I do about it and feeling so totally powerless. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then realizing like, I, I need to allow myself to be sad about this. Mm -hmm. I need to actually stop like pushing those emotions away yep. and let them come into my body. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this documentary I'd watched um, called How to Let Go of the World and How to Let Go of the World and Love All the Things Climate Can't Change by Josh Fox. Okay. And he interviews this uh, climate activist, Tim DeChristopher, who, who bid up the price of, of uh, land in Utah when they opened it for oil speculation. Mm -hmm. And then he refused to pay for the bid and he like went to jail for several years for that. Um, but he, when De De Christopher asked him like, how do you deal with all of this? And, or sorry, Josh Fox asked De Christopher, how do you deal with all of this? And De Christopher said, I just had to be sad all the time. I just had to be sad all the time. I just had time. to be sad all the time. So there was this shift that I went through where I was like, I just have to be sad all the time. Interesting. I, I can't like, I can't keep like trying to evoke these emotions by endlessly scrolling through news feeds and like trying to catch up on the latest updates about it and like sharing it on Facebook or like social media yeah. to like get other people more woke about it you know yeah. I have to feel it as deeply as I possibly can and you're making a distinction there between depression and sadness yeah which I think is really important yeah when you're describing depression I'm seeing it as like you're saying like pushing away mm -hmm. and almost it's more like numbness right in a way it's like numbing yourself to the thing it's like it's like there's I imagine depression as this massive weight black of blackness that's like looming over us and crushing us down into smallness uh -huh. and we're just like squeezed into this uh -huh. narrow sense of who we are and what we're capable of doing in the world yeah and for me i wanted to just like open myself up and actually like let that come through me i didn't know if it would ever end this huh. sadness or this sense of being sad all the time um does it transform it's totally been transformative because uh -huh. when i experienced this not only did I begin to start to experience, you know, greater depths of sadness, I also didn't know what I wanted, who I really was, like what I even liked, I no. thought I liked anymore, or what I, what I thought I was supposed to do. I had a lot of all these questions and I spent so much time just, instead of like distracting myself with TV shows or video games or even books, like I, I read, I read, you know, I read a lot mm -hmm. and uh, reading is kind of like how I, yeah, I, I identify myself as like, I'm a reader. Like I just read yeah, all these yeah. books. And have you read this one? Have you read this one? No, I have, you know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, I started to just kind of like sit and not do anything. And uh -huh. it, was, it was meditating because I was like sitting and I was really trying to like feel what I felt and understand what I felt and like feel it in my body. Uh -huh. um, and so that's like a big part of the Good Grief Network mm. is is you kind of leading people through this personal process even though you didn't make up this framework this is a bigger framework right. and you're helping to facilitate it now but it sounds like your process mirrors kind of what you guys are doing yeah in those good grief meetings yeah i came to think of what i was doing when i was like sitting and trying to feel my feelings in my body as like holding space yeah for myself holding space for the wounded parts of myself uh -huh. my like wounds from childhood or um, the, the, the aspects of my life that have been stamped down, I guess, the um, parts of myself that have not known love. Mm -hmm. um, that's not necessarily part of the Good Grief Network, but with the Good Grief Network and my experience with it, there was at some point a shift where I was like setting out to like grieve all the stuff that was out there. Mm -hmm. But then at some point I realized like I was actually projecting a lot of my own wounding into the world outside right the, my own trauma like I was like trying to feel it by like looking at all this out there and at some point I, I kind of consider this as like a long turning inward uh-huh <laughs> it's a mirror basically yeah all that stuff going on outside yeah I mean it's 
terrible and traumatic and totally disorienting. But yeah. Um, oh, but you were, you said something like, uh, was it transformative? This letting becoming sad all the time. Not yeah. only did I just experience sadness, but um, there's a quote, quote by uh, William Blake: "The deeper my sorrow, the greater my joy." Yeah, yeah. And uh, I began to experience. I, I have a young daughter, and at the time she was um, just an infant, and I just began to experience so much more like joy and just being with her or just like going on walks like kind of seemed like I could attune more more yeah just attune more to like the world around me like right. leaves and shadows and trees you know it's just like everything kind of became more beautiful and um, yeah. I was drawn more to nature I guess interesting I mean that's what a lot of those great mystics talk about like we talked about Martin Freckel earlier mm -hmm. and it's like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. his whole kick is that whole like being able to grieve really well mm. allows you to praise really well yeah and so it sounds like pretty much the same thing with that yeah. william blake quote and with your mm -hmm. experience but like how do you practically start to let in that numbness or like let mm. that numbness like you describe that dark thing on top of you yeah like and yeah i mean this is something i've been thinking about actually today it was on my mind mm. Because there's all these memes on Facebook right now. I mean, we're in like this tumultuous time of like yeah. social unrest and everything. Just for people who are watching, of course, people probably know that. Um, but like, there's so much like you should feel this way, you should feel this way, yeah. you'd be acting this way, this way. It's like all this stuff. And there was some meme on there talking about people like being depressed. Mm. Like you need to feel depressed for all the racism that's going on and like face that stuff. Uh, and for me, it was like. I think it's, it's maybe a ma matter of semantics, but like, I don't want people to feel depressed. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily think that's constructive. I think yeah. what you're talking about though, is something that's a little bit more uh, expansive than depression. Yeah. It's like feeling sadness yeah. and being okay with that. Yeah. That's, what's under, that, that's what's underneath all the rage. Like that's mm. like psychology 101 right there. When someone's the mad- feeling under every hard feeling. Exactly, exactly. There's always sadness under it. There's mm. always grief under it. So I like this kind of work because it's like getting towards the actual root. Yeah. And that's what I like. Like I feel like society is mm. so on the surface of everything. Everything's black and white. Yeah. But there's a root to all this, you know? Mm. And like I feel like that grief that you're touching on is something that we all like collectively have access mm. to. So I guess my question in saying all that is how do you maybe this is very ethereal, but like how did you start to let that sadness in? Was it just sitting and like being quiet or I think, like I mentioned, that documentary and this activist, Tim DeChristopher, yeah. it was kind of like that was an invitation from the world mm -hmm. into this new way of being. And there were several other books that I read. One of them was Beyond Hope by Debo Zarco. Another one's The Wild Edge of Sorrow by mm -hmm. Francis Weller, who okay. um, talks about starting an apprenticeship with sorrow and how life is an apprenticeship with sorrow. Mm. Um, and so I kind of like had these access points where I was like, the idea was like sort of turning in my mind yeah. that, um, that there was this way into it yeah. that I could not, I could kind of switch. And there was like, and I also saw in these people, they talked about their journey through it and it, and it seemed like there was something beyond the sadness, uh, okay. that it wasn't just an eternal darkness. Yeah. I think you kind of have to like go into it being ready for eternal darkness mm. or like an endless descent it's not necessarily a light at the end you have to be ready that it's going to take maybe years like for me it's i don't know i feel like now i'm beginning to come out of this like this process started for me maybe two years ago yeah and uh now i'm beginning to come out of it and feel like a deeper sense of connection and, and joy and hope mm -hmm. hope beyond the hopes the ephemeral hopes of like solutions of technology you know electric cars or solar power or institutional reform or presidential candidates a deeper hope that comes from the um, weird and wild resilience of the earth and its deep time imagination this is more this is almost like a trust that yeah, things are going to be okay but i saw i think in these people that like there was a way through mm -hmm. and then people like michael mead really opened the way for me as well and you mentioned um, Martin Prechtel, another one for me was Martin Shaw, uh -huh. these mythologists who talk about um, myth being this kind of like, almost like psychological um, narratives that allow, that kind of show the way through these under, kind of underworld journeys. Yeah. And it came to this understanding that like, there used to be, in many traditions, um, 
spaces for people to be broken, times for rites of passage, for underworld journeys, for um, coming of age rituals, where you face the person that you had been and you kind of let go of that person to become who you really are. Um, and this is <laughs> this is all like my own journey, mm -hmm. which paralleled the journey of good grief. But I think the container that good grief set, which was very simple, you know, we start with a check in and a, do a check out, mm -hmm. and then we sh we read an introduction to that week's step, whether that's accept the severity of the predicament or accept how I'm part of the problem and also part of the solution, or one of the steps is also. Um, like accept my own mortality and the mortality of all. Mm. And I've been through these steps several times now, so these themes are just kind of like reiterating through my consciousness. Mm -hmm. And um, then we open up the, pro the program to be like, each person shares, you know, and in sharing, no one talks over you, no one tries to like interject their own thoughts. It's mm -hmm. just this process of trying to communicate through words, through facial expression, these turbulent things that are locked up inside okay to actually and having feel, uh... a community bear witness to you mm -hmm. and uh that was that was a powerful experience because i never had that before like my parents didn't didn't model emotional resilience or um healthy emotionality or vulnerability mm. um and yeah so i think that was kind of the gateway it was like this vague sense of yeah yeah Absolutely. And That's opening amazing. it up, you know, like allowing yourself to go in there, like kind of, yeah, I remember there was just like one weekend when I was visiting my wife's parents' place in uh, Napa, um, and I, I was just like sullen that whole weekend. That was the weekend I was reading the Deva Zarko book, and I was coming to this like decision where like, I think I have to be sad all the time. Wow. And that, that phrase for me was just so evocative. Yeah. Uh, I was like, okay, yeah, sad all the time. And that shifted the way that I showed up in the world where I could like go to parties or go to like social gatherings or like even when I met a friend I could I didn't have to smile I didn't have to pretend I was okay in our culture we have this like you know how you doing mm -hmm. and it's un unacceptable to say not good you know like whoever says I'm not good yeah it's always it happens good, every once in a while <laughs> yeah once in a while but like then it's like awkward you know it can be <laughs> yeah but I was like fuck that I'm just gonna like yeah. frown I'm going to wow. sit in the corner and brood if that's what I feel like okay, I need to do. Okay. So it was a total shift in the way I was like showing up, you know? Still showing up and being able to show up like yeah, however you Yeah, showing up however I actually was. Right, right. You know? yeah. That's what's up. I mean, because I feel like, you know, with my personal experience and probably a lot of people, it's like when you feel shitty, when you feel sad, when you mm. feel depressed or whatever it is, it's like so easy to just isolate and stay in and like not deal with people. I mean, yeah. it's like a natural way that a lot of people cope it's almost mm -hmm. like you, it's like this demon that doesn't want you to get pulled out of it yeah but that's cool to just show up and like go to those places and like be okay with being sad yeah but do you feel like you've gotta like like do you have tools where you feel like you can bring yourself out of it mm. or do you not want to bring yourself out of it it's kind of what i I'm... think for me i had to go so completely into it huh. as fully as i could as fully as i was currently capable at the time yeah um yeah but it, like I said, it wasn't just sadness. It was more like that was the that was the evocative phrase that like invited me into a new way of being. Mm -hmm. But it was like how I was all the time wasn't just sad. It was more like I could more accurately respond to the situation in my inner world, the mm -hmm. outer world, and the inner world was like kind of like coming back closer in the sink, I guess, for me. Right on. Yeah. I mean, it's not like obviously I'm not totally attuned now. You know, I want to get to that point. You're not but, perfectly um, enlightened yet. No. It's never. It's an ongoing trip. <laughs> I'm hoping that people are projecting that onto you. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, not um, quite. Yeah. It's, it's... Francis Weller also has this... Uh, he also like leads grief rituals. He's actually in um, Northern California. Um, Marin County, I think. Uh -huh. He's a grief counselor and leads these grief rituals. And in his book, he talks about five gateways of grief the first is personal loss mm -hmm. you know, the death of a loved one or the loss of your you know vitality or you know something like that which is kind of where our society like our society like limits grief to that for the most part but there are these four other gateways through which grief enters our life through which sorrow enters our life uh -huh. the second one is 
grief for the parts of ourselves that have not known love. The third one, I think, is um, collective grief or the grief for like what's happening in the world. The fourth is grief for the things we expected coming into this world and did not receive. And as an illustration of that, it says humans, for the most part of their 300 plus thousand year experience of life on Earth, have been part of really tight-knit communi communities where when you come into this group, your village, you have 40 pairs of eyes greeting you, 40 pairs of eyes seeing you and helping you find your way in the world. You have elders who have walked the way and people who can like witness your gifts and help you come into life. You know? We don't have that. I don't even feel that close to my family. You know? yeah. um, and it's really rare to find friends who can do that for you in this world now. And then the last one is ancestral grief. The grief passed down to you from your ancestors yeah. that's unprocessed for them. Mm -hmm. That's just crazy. And there's like studies coming out where it shows that your genes can be mm. switched on and off depending mm. on traumas that have happened mm. to your ancestors. So mm. it's like on this spiritual level, but also mm. this physiological level. But I, I see the spiritual and the physical as being like yeah. super entwined anyway. Yeah. So that's increasingly been my experience as well. Yeah. Even emotional, like mental, like it's really all like kind of one thing. Yeah. There's no real psychological out there. Yeah. It's all part of part of this whole. Mm. And there's also no, nothing that's purely physical. It's like mm. there's tons of you know. Mm. There, it's very ephemeral. Mm. It's very ephemeral and very moved by our our minds and our perceptions. Yeah. So I had this experience when I was turned on to Francis Bella's work in the beginning of their Greek uh, work, uh, the Greek network where I was like, okay, I had this like kind of temporary experience of feeling more alive. Uh -huh. Maybe that's a better word to, way to say it, right? It's like, I'm not I'm not turning off my sadness necessarily, but I'm more like a lot of like being sad all the time, letting in my emotions. It doesn't exclude happiness or joy. Yeah, it means yeah. I'm more alive. I kind of know what you mean. It's like yeah. when you have like a good cry or like you yeah. feel like you've moved through something, you feel like more like human yeah. afterwards, like more like, like drop yeah. in. Yeah. So I was like, well, I just want to like let it all in. So I constructed this little ritual of my own where I like made a little altar in the redwoods in this special place that I have above Berkeley. And um, I, just, I had like little objects to represent each of the gateways. Uh -huh. And I picked them up and like, you know, kind of like sort of made a ritualistic beginning point of this thing. And I don't know, maybe I sang or something like that. And then I picked each of these objects up and tried to like recite my grief and try to like let it come through me. Your grief with each of those different each of categories. The, yeah, each of those categories. Uh -huh. And I was hoping, like, finally I could have, like, one big cry and have, all my grief would be gone. Like, I could finally have this burden removed from me, you know, yeah. from all the trauma or the sorrow or whatever I've been through in my life, you know. Um, and, yeah, I, I didn't cry, and I couldn't cry. Uh -huh. and for the longest time, I couldn't cry until, like, maybe four or five months ago, and there was a series of events that seemed like the world, as I showed my like willingness to do this, the world was like inviting me more fully into this experience, and then I just like cracked open. Mm -hmm. And then there were weeks when I was just crying every day, wow. like for hours sometimes. Wow! And it was just the weirdest experience. And I felt like I don't even know what I could do anymore. I don't know what where where we're going in the world. I like lost hope that you know. Imagine that my daughter will be a climate refugee living in like an apocalyptic society or something like that. And I just like let it all in and it was all just like breaking me apart in so many ways. And I was going in therapy at this time uh -huh. as well and my therapist, you know, I was just like, I think the only thing I can do is cry. I think that's what I've been made for. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I was kind of like, maybe that's okay. And she said, yeah. imagine if every man in the world cried for an hour a day. The world would change overnight hmm. and that was like okay maybe that's what i'm that's what i'm gonna do that's just what i'm gonna do right and of course it dried up at some point but like just being able to accept that and sink into that and allow that in was like i don't know transformative i guess that's amazing dude thanks for sharing that yeah <laughs> I've, uh, I've i've been through th times like that too yeah currently currently not so much mm -hmm. i feel more like hardened off um but I think we all have seasons to our lives and just like season, I mean, it all shifts. And then when you're in that moment where it's yeah. like, you're like really going into that, like I'm crying a lot, I'm really feeling a lot of stuff. 
it feels like it's never gonna live, and yeah. you're like, just it's like this is life pretty much. Yeah. But I think it's yeah, it is good. It is good, and I'm like, I'm missing that emotionality <laughs> as you're talking about it. I'm like, yeah, I know it feels good. It does it's feel like good. Liberating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like anything else in life. Like the hardest part is starting, mm. and then like once it's going, it's like okay, I can like kind of open the well, especially for like people who are socialized male and like mm. not to get into like any kind of victim pity me kind of stuff like I think, yeah. I think that stuff is it's very easy I think that's why I'm a little bit resistant to some aspects of grief and depression because I think we can sort of victimize ourselves mm. and um, I don't think that's helpful mm. uh, I think that we got to like rise up above that stuff like mm. recognize the victim stories that we all have mm. and then like be able to, to rise up because I really don't think anyone cares that much I think everyone has their victim story and everyone wants it to be heard yeah. in some way I think it's more about for me allowing myself to realize the ways that I was and I guess let me sh share another um, uh, there's a poet Robert Bly who talks about this um, describes the process of growing up and forming a socially prescribed identity mm -hmm. as like you're born into the world as this 360 degree orb of radiance so much joy and energy and love and creative potential mm -hmm. and as we're going through childhood as we become an adult more and more of that radiance slivers of it are being like broken off and shoved into this long black bag that we carry behind us oh, I've heard we're just of this. dragging it yeah. behind us and uh it's the every, shadow so to speak yeah every time you know a parent says don't cry mm -hmm. or don't feel that way or teachers like you know, tells you to be quiet and sit quietly in your classroom while you want to like be running outside and playing tag with your friends. Yeah. More and more of our cells are like creative, wild, erotic, vital cells. It's just shrinking and shrinking until we get this kind of patterning where we are making ourselves shrink, mm -hmm. you know? So in that way, each of us is a victim, is a victim right. of this system. And obviously there are some who are way more victimized than others yeah. and who have experienced so much more pain at the hands of this system than others. And each little person doesn't have the capacity, like each little human animal with big confusing emotions doesn't necessarily have the capacity or the ability to like process those emotions, to understand the world, to make sense of it, to have, to model for themselves yet how to be, you know? And so I think for me the process of it's not I don't like that idea I guess of vic being a, considering myself a victim but it's more like recognizing the ways that I have been wounded and also the ways that I have inflicted wounds upon others. Exactly. And for me that that is actually what grief is. It's not like a feeling we experience. Mm -hmm. Grief is more like a quality of awareness that we shine on ourselves and allow hold space for others. Quality of awareness yeah. that we shine on ourselves. And hold space for others. Okay, I like that. I like that. That allows also for the those wounds to be healed. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's that's what it's about. Is mm -hmm. like it's active. I think you got to kind of go through the victim story a little bit throughout mm -hmm. that process too. Mm -hmm. Is like really like touch into like how much that hurts. Yeah. And like even the feeling sorry for yourself, like that. Mm -hmm. Those things you got to kind of touch into a little bit too to like really experience the full amount of it. Yeah. But it's like for that real societal healing and for like healing of like people who are just historically like repressed and emotions mm. and whatnot i think yeah getting down to that like grief and the sadness is going to be extremely beneficial for like the entire world yeah you know so like people are just acting out of like this kind of unconscious rage yeah that's coming out of just being really freaking sad yeah yeah i think that's what you're kind of speaking to yeah when it comes to like if a guy could even your therapist is saying like if guys cry like one hour a day <laughs> the world would be healed very quickly not necessarily healed but change radically yeah like, change. women need to cry too everybody needs to cry 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah that's amazing that's amazing work that y'all are doing like um, and those groups, I mean, they're what, like 10, 15 people or so? Like, how do y'all kind of structure? Up to 15 or 16. Uh, current group I'm facilitating, I think, has 12 plus two facilitators, or maybe 12 plus the two facilitators. And sure. you're one of the facilitators now, yeah. now that you've gone through it a couple of times. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's 
just holding space is the main quality that you need to yeah. be a facilitator. Like, I mean, having gone through it. Do you actually participate as well as a facilitator? Yeah, I mean, it's also for me. You okay. Know, I'm continuously going through this journey. Yeah, know? yeah. And, and also, for me, the experience has been so, like, it's helped me to feel the things that I've been feeling. Because I finally I found this place where other people were attempting to grapple with the severity of the predicament, you know. But then these other people from all the different places of the world, like, they're, uh, my last online call was like people in Australia were there, or someone in Australia and um, different parts of America, you know. So you're kind of getting a variety of experiences and a variety of exposures to the effects of climate change. I see. I think in my first group there was a woman who was experiencing, I don't know, her town was experiencing like massive flooding at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was like, like, because for the longest time for me it had been like, oh, just like reading articles and living in the Bay Area, it's like, okay, we're getting like fires and it seems like there's fires up until last year. It didn't feel like it was affecting us here, right where I'm living in my own life, like that drastically. But I was trying to make myself feel what was happening out there. So then having people and sitting in group with people who were actually experiencing it was like, oh yeah, this is really happening. You know, right. I, could, I could actually more directly, viscerally connect with that. Totally. Yeah. Totally. That's interesting. Um, yeah, because I mean, it's kind of that thing with like the 150 people rule. Like you can mm. kind of imagine 150 people in your tribe, but like our brains can't go a whole lot further yeah. than that. Yeah. But we're constantly bombarded with like, you know, we know news of a lot more people mm. and we know news that's happening from like Australia and like, you know, these mm. places, but it's hard to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of yeah. hard to empathize with almost because it's so far away. Yeah. But to have that connection with people from over there, it's like it sounds like it's changing your perception of it. Mm -hmm. And then I guess where I'm wanting to go with this is like it seems like doing the work, the grief is one aspect to it. And then how do we, mm. how does that then become actionable? Ah. Do, you, do we know the answer? We don't know the answer yet. The last step of the Good Grief Network is yeah. recommit to meaningful action. Commit to meaningful that's action. A, that's the last step of the 10-step program. All right. Um, and it's the circle. Uh -huh. I mean, you start over at the beginning. Okay. You know, uh, or whoever, whenever you need it. Similar to Joanna, Joanna Macy's um, work that reconnects. There's moments when you go through grief. There's moments when, having gone through grief, you come out into the world with a new sense of, like, what she calls it, new eyes or something like that yeah new vision of the world allows yeah. you to recommit recommit to action okay. which generates gratitude which then leads back into grief i think that's how her cycle oh wow to like all to right check that but all right um and yeah that's kind of at the different different times for me in the process like each of the step uh, each of the rounds that i participate in recommitting to meaningful action meant something different mm -hmm. at one point it was like i'm gonna be i'm just gonna do my best to be a good father right Mm -hmm. you know, to be as present as I possibly can for Lyra during these times. Yep. Lyra's my daughter. At another time, it was, well, I'm going to write a new story. You know, like, I feel called, like, this is this is my calling to be a writer and to bring these themes and, um, into science fiction, into fantasy, um, into, like, weaving a new vision of where humans might be going on the Earth and what it means to be human. And that was the work that I was called to. Yeah. And maybe now, you know, like being called into action it means like actually going to protests and showing up for your neighbors, you know, um, and challenging, having hard conversations. I have some pretty hard conversations now with my dad. But it's always different. It's always shifting, you know, mm -hmm. to say that it's one thing is uh, like, okay, now this is the formula and you can get back to work. Right. You know, like for me, I had to accept that my grief might be endless. Like I might just be stuck in this sorrow forever. And that was where I felt was appropriate for me. Yeah. But I also have the sense of like, deep down in the depths of your despair, there is a, there is like a new, new life. There's a resurrection at the bottom of it. Mm. You discover what I consider to be, this is also from Michael Mead, the golden thread of life golden thread of your life and also the golden thread of life in general once you let in this all of these ways that you've experienced can, can being coming conditioned into smallness through your life once you've gone through the process of that 
then you can come back to this glowing orb of radiance and you're so much more effective maybe in the world yeah yeah so that's where i that's where i see the process leading that's I mean, that's not a, that's not a distinct formula okay once you go through your steps then you can go join the front lines and be an activist again mm -hmm. you know it's it's more like each person's calling is unique and beautiful and it's going through this process of remembering who we are and remembering remembering what we are called to do i guess exactly that. yeah i mean it's like for me thinking about action and how action oriented we all are and yeah. how that's almost like a band-aid yeah to just keep on going and it's mm -hmm. not necessarily the most um effective thing that we could even be doing mm -hmm. like speaking that language yeah but to go through the grief and then to be held in community and witnessed around that yeah and then go through all that and then come out and come out with an action plan i feel like it's like the old saying like work smarter not harder mm. kind of thing it's like we can actually be more effective as climate advocates mm. as you know um advocates for yeah equality yeah. and human rights and all that yeah. and permaculturists and and all that um it's like the observing thing right mm. in permaculture rather than just like all mm. right let's go in and like start fixing the land because that's where my mind goes a lot of times i'm just mm. like this is crazy that we live in this state like we know that it's gonna be burning in a few months like there's it's pretty much a guarantee that like yeah. this state is gonna tremendously burn yeah. in the fall and we just kind of sit back and like chill and like go back to work yeah go back to work <laughs> put on your mask let's just wear a mask 365 you know and i don't know it, it, it sometimes it plagues me to think that mm. uh, we just kind of like go about business as usual when like things are really really tremendously bad and yeah, I think yeah. people would actually feel a lot better if we were all working together to be fixing that or like working on that stuff yeah. in a good way. But I think what you're talking about brings up this point of like, if we just go into action mode, we are going to perpetuate the same kind of issues. Mm. If it's not coming from a place that's remotely healed mm. inside of us, yeah. it can't just be external. It like has to like start internally mm. and then go out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think people like gotta, we gotta, be able to mobilize though at the same time yeah. and like take actions yeah um but yeah the fire thing is just one that always is, is constantly on my mind in the past few years of like we have the we have the power to go out and, and heal these things yeah but we don't and so like where do we start to how do we start to address that part and like joel salatin will say um it's not that humans are lazy it's that humans have worked towards the wrong things Mm. Like if we redirected our attention mm. and like used our, it felt good to work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like we're and most, tuned into this vision. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But that's like the internal healing that has to happen, mm. so that people's priorities will change. Because it's like that hungry ghost that we all have, mm. wanting yes. to fill that void. Yeah. Because we don't have that connection with with spirit or community or however you want to call it. It's like constantly get more stuff, acquire more land. You know. Yeah. Get a new computer, get a new phone. Um, yeah but healing like that kind of stuff and that's where i think the grief work begins to touch into that mm -hmm. and i love that that's done in community mm -hmm. because it's, it's very um uh, it's tough to be able to like cry in front of people like yeah. straight up like definitely for me like, i can do it by myself but to have like a community that holds you in that grief mm -hmm. that's a whole different kind of healing that happens mm -hmm. I haven't been able to cry in the grief circles. It's all, it's all on my own. <laughs> right on, right on. Dude, yeah, I mean, I was in... Yeah, but I, I get that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, not to make this about me, this is your interview. But it's, about, it's both of our interviews. It's both of our interviews. Yeah. Um, You're doing a great job, by the way. Thank you, you too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate your affirmation. Um, but I'm also working on not needing approval okay, for anyone. Great, yeah. But it does feel good to get approval. Um, but yeah, like going through school and like going through all these group processes and and going to psychotherapy training, it was like, I, I was never able to cry in front of a group of people. Oh yeah. It was, it was felt very, very unsafe. Yeah. Felt very unsafe. And I think that's probably some conditioning and socializing for being a kid and being made fun of or yeah. something, you know, yeah, yeah. being a sensitive kid as I think you, you perhaps were as well. <laughs> I'm just kind of getting, really? yeah, but it's, it's like, that's not manly or like, that's not yeah. the right way to be. Yeah, I think we're changing that narrative. Like, I hope so. Yeah. You can have conversations like this, you know, it's like... Totally. It's and, part of it. And that's what I'm saying. I think the vulnerability can be very strengthening. Mm. 
and when we're doing it in a way that's not coming from like feel sorry for me or like you know mm. kind, of a, kind of a thing mm. um, but when it's very like it's for the sake of the greater good yeah. it's not just for yourself yeah. that makes me think of uh, a chaplain friend of mine probably my closest friend has introduced me to this idea the music behind the words what like when you're a chaplain you listen to when you're trying to um, you know serve someone or be with someone mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's kind of what I began to try to attune, attune to you know uh -huh. there's a lot of things that people are saying that are uh, a lot of times when people are saying something that triggers something inside of you or like potentially a reactive thing you know in the political discourse now, you know, mm -hmm. so polarized. And it has been immensely helpful for me to be, try to imagine that, like, what is the music coursing behind these words? Like, what is, what are they really saying when they're saying what they're saying? What are they, what is their rage? What is their grief? Where is it coming from? You know, mm -hmm. if it's something that I don't agree with or if that's something that I feel is hurtful to me or for others, each of us has that and each of us perpetuates I sort of lost my train of thought a little bit there, but yeah, I guess through this process of sitting in circle, of bearing witness to other people's vulnerability, which I think of as them trying to tap into that music behind their own words and allow it to sing forth, mm -hmm. then I can hear it more in myself and I can hear it more in people outside of circle as well, yeah. which has made it much easier for me to be in community with people that I don't agree with. That's a good tool. So you're saying like listening to sort of the tone of what they're saying like yeah. the feeling of where it's coming from the musicality behind it mm. is more important than maybe the words that they're saying yeah, at yeah. Times. and uh <laughs> it's always funny when people in the it's like in the circle you have this um introduction to the step and we're reading you know a couple paragraphs about accepting the severity of the predicament um and people are responding to that and it's Sometimes people would actually like write down points ahead of time. I would yes. I didn't ever actually do that, but um, I definitely, you know, in my first few sessions, I would like be kind of like, oh, what am I going to say when it's my turn? Oh, oh now, now everybody else is gone and I got to go, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but now I've gone to the point where it's kind of like, uh, actually, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter what we say and the words we use. Mm. But in this space where we're trying to make it safe for everybody, to say and show up with their vulnerability and their brokenness um it kind of yeah that like the meaning matters more or like what you're trying to say matters more or, like the emotion behind those words matters more so i kind of started like allowing myself to take long pauses if i needed to okay like okay i'm gonna try to share and then have like a i'm just like i just sit there for like 30 seconds or something uh -huh. eventually i start talking like once i can kind of like feel that inside me express it through words yeah and um a lot of times people would say like i don't know what i'm gonna say and then like their shares would be the most profound thing and i'm like you're like the wisest person i've ever heard mm. and just being sitting in circle has been such a beautiful experience it's like weaving this garment of collective wisdom because i feel said. that we each have that within us yeah and it's just we don't get the chances to listen to it to ourselves yep. and for others to witness it very often Right. And so, speaking also to your being active in the world, I think cultivating that wisdom and cultivating that centeredness and cultivating this capacity to act mm -hmm. from that place mm -hmm. allows a totally different kind of action in the world out there, you know? Yeah. Or, if that makes sense. I think so. Kind of kind of <laughs> I'm with you, though. I'm with um, you, though. Let me see. Well, maybe we, uh, yeah. maybe, we, I mean, we were talking about doing some experiential, <sighs> wow. experiential stuff. You good? <laughs> I can, yeah, I can try. <laughs> we could try it. We could try I mean, I think some people might be on. We have some comments coming through. We're at like 50 minutes. So if we were oh, wow. in, in a true therapy session, it would be ending right now. We'd Am I like, in therapy or are you in therapy? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> <We're both laughs> no, one, no one knows. There's no context. <laughs> We're sitting here in what would be my therapy office, so. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's cool. Um, but let's see if people are people are on, and we could just do some of the exercise. You could you could perform it on me, and um, go from there.
All right. Yeah, we're still oh, recording. Well, I'm not really uh, just preface this by saying I haven't really done this very often, or um, mostly I do this kind of exercise for my own self. We're here to learn. And it's uh, just a practice of trying to center ourselves in our body and to see, to bear witness to the places where we are holding challenging emotions in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's just a simple meditation. So you can begin with a couple um, deep breaths. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Feeling the softness of your breath. Feeling the freshness of the air. Feeling the relaxation, the smoothness coursing in and out of your lungs. And as you feel centered in that, just sort of try to let your attention loosely wander to where you're feeling tension. Are you tense in your eyebrow or your side of your head? Is there tension in your throat or in your chest or in your gut maybe, abdomen? What does that feel like? As you're breathing in, you're breathing out. How is it, how is it making it harder to breathe? What kind of emotion is that? Or what kind of emotion might be caught up in that place in your body? What kind of person is that tension driving to be? And as you're breathing in and out, feeling this relaxation filling your body. Can you relax those tension spots? If it's hard to relax, then why is it hard to relax? your body with your breath. Thank your body with your awareness. Breathe it all out. That was, um, I could kind of describe how it, how it was rather than give it an adjective. Yeah. I felt a tension in my chest cavity, mm. what would be called the heart, I suppose. Yeah. And there was almost this swimming motion mm. of like somebody like kayaking. It was almost like that was the sensation that was tight for me. Mm. And as I just kept breathing into it, I didn't have a whole lot of story that came up around it necessarily, but just as I kept breathing into it, it seemed to relax because mm. it was a slightly uncomfortable tension. Mm. But yeah, it felt it feels more spacious now, and it was associating for me with like it was giving me some cool work ideas. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I think it, I think it was. It was inspiring. I felt inspired. It wasn't necessarily the work nice, ideas, but it was nice a feeling of inspiration. Relaxed. Yeah. There was, for... there was some space for some feeling of inspiration when the cool. tension relaxed. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool to kind of get down to that, which manifested with some quote unquote work ideas. But these things aren't things I consider to be work. It's more like things I'm passionate about anyway. Mm -hmm. So.
Amazing, thank you. And I was appreciating the like sound of uh, trash trucks going oh, by yeah. during it <laughs> with the sound of the birds singing at the same time. Yeah, yeah, the juxtaposition. So, the juxtaposition was incredible. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, I mean, we could talk for probably hours, yeah. but um, yeah, sure. we usually will talk for hours when we're landscaping together. I feel <laughs> like we should record that stuff. Yeah. It's really great. Um, but yeah, do you want to... Uh, I can put this once I put this up on YouTube. I'll, I'll include this in show notes and whatnot. But the um, to the Good Grief Network. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Good Grief Network. A, we have a program coming up. Uh, there's another around finishing up soon, and then another one will start at the end of July. Um, July. I have to check. Check, but it's either July. It's the latter half of July, um, and I believe it's going to be Tuesdays at five or something. Is it virtual? Yeah, it'll be virtual. Everything's virtual now. Everything's but, virtual yeah. now. Yeah, um, lots of things. I'll be one of the facilitators, and my friend Sarah, you know Sarah. Yeah, yeah. The other facilitator. Do y'all have to? You have to be in the Bay Area to do it, or is no, it? No, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. You can sign up from anywhere. Cool. Um, yeah, it's been transformative for me and life saving. <laughs> amazing. Life affirming. Life affirming. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. There's something to that. It's amazing. And there's ch there's more than one chapter of it. Uh, yeah, like. You can also, there on the website, there are resources to become a facilitator. You can get the 10 step program and introduce it to your own community. Um, there's facilitator trainings. Um, uh, last fall, I hosted one locally in Oakland. Mm -hmm. That's how Sarah and I became uh, facilitators. And the official facilitators, Laura and Amy, who founded the program, Laura Schmidt and Amy Lewis Rowe, um, invited us to be their like, official facilitators for the through the website I guess got you so um, incredible uh, yeah that's been cool but also you can you know just take the material and start your own little good grief group but sweet I feel it's helpful for has been had been helpful for me to sit through several rounds of the program before becoming a facilitator yeah but yeah absolutely man it seems like important work that we all should be doing and I wouldn't say should be doing. I don't want to tell anybody what to do. Could but if you, if you could be doing it, and if you feel so called. Yeah, if it's something that calls to you. Right, right. Yeah. Amazing. And then what about your, uh, that article, or the story you're getting published? What about it? Where, oh. where can we find this? <laughs> uh, I want to read it. Did I talk about it in the beginning? I forgot we started. You recording. did, yeah, yeah. We were recording at that point. I'm not sure when it'll come that out, loop. but uh, it'll, it'll be in uh, Analog Science Fiction and Fact magazine. Um, probably in a couple months i got the contract and everything i signed it so okay um, and i got paid for the story so Congrats, uh, man. <laughs> thank you that's incredible uh yeah so all right so look at that in a few a, months got some other stuff brewing as well in terms of writing and stories so okay. possibly that will be out out in the world soon too right on man i feel like we've been talking about this the whole time but this is usually a question that i i do ask people i guess we can end on this one um, is there anything that's in your life that feels like an eco-therapy practice for oh. you? <laughs> that feels supportive? I mean, that could be yeah. like, you know, mushroom coffee in the morning, like something simple, or is it, you know, taking your daughter for a walk, or just anything that feels relevant for you, like, right now? Oh, the mushroom coffee has been pretty good. Well, it's not mushroom coffee, but it's mud water. It's uh, mud water. a blend of chai and um, adaptogenic mushrooms. It's been kind of cool as a um, supplement to coffee, or instead of coffee. Are you off the coffee kick right I'm, now? I'm... I'm off the coffee. Sometimes I still need naps in the morning <laughs> with the adaptogenic mushroom co coffee. Uh, coffee substitute. There's no but, coffee uh, substitute. I, I was introduced to, I don't know how I got introduced to this, the Russell Brand podcast. I think I was reminded about um, Wim Hof, the Wim Hof uh, method. Oh, yes, yes. So he does, he does uh, uh, kind of an intense breathing practice, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty close to holotropic breathing mm -hmm. uh, that I had researched as well. But I've been doing that pretty much daily, and that has been really helpful to sink deep into my emotions. That you go through this process of breathing, like I sometimes do it slower than that, however you feel comfortable. And then after doing that for 30, um, 30 rounds of that, 30 breaths, then you mm -hmm. hold your breath on the out breath, you're like for as long as you can, mm -hmm. and then suck it in hold it for 20 seconds on the in-breath and then go back into the cycle of quick breathing okay. and I found that when I'm holding on my out breath uh -huh. these spots in my body where I feel I've come to think of as like this is actually where emotion 
is manifesting and locked up in my body, yep. I can sink into these spots and more easily like break them up, like you described. And break them up. Draw my awareness to that place. Like I, for the longest time, felt deep anxiety in my chest. And doing this process, gradually I sank into deeper like states of emotion mm -hmm. where I would just be like crying while doing this breathing. Wow. It was almost like as I was drawing my awareness deeper into my body, I was sinking into that repressed emotion, I guess. And That's liberating incredible. It. How and many the other aspect is cold cold exposure. You're doing cold exposure? Well, like cold showers and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I, I haven't gotcha. quite done a cold bath yet, but okay. I'd be willing to challenge myself to do that if totally if I could find one. All the I guess I gotta go jump in the bay, right? Right. Go to the ocean yeah. or something at least. But that also, um, I've noticed, um, and you might want to research something about the way that the vagus nerve holds um, tension. Mm-hmm. Um, and that how, how breath work like this can help to reduce inf inflammation in the vagus nerve, in that right. vagus nerve system. Um, when I researched the vagus nerve, I saw that all, all, all the places where it kind of like went up through your body, yep. and then kind of like veins through the side of your head like this, yep. like, oh, those are the exact places where I'm feeling tension. Wow. In the sides of my head, in my eyebrow, Incredible. my chest. And the cold shower helps to the relax shower, the vagus nerve too. Like right now, I don't know, because we're on performing, I'm sort of feeling some tension here. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's heady conversation. Yeah, yeah, and um, and but like just taking a cold shower when I feel that usually like kind of like calms that. It's interesting. Me. It's been amazing for sleep and for like uh -huh. waking up in the morning. If I don't do it in the morning, I feel like my day is just kind of like thrown off now. If you don't do the Wim Hof and the cold shower, I don't always do the breathing in the morning, but I try to do the breathing at least once a day. Okay. And I try to start my morning with a cold shower. And before I go to sleep. Gotcha. And then does it, the vagus nerve also connects some of the jaw and stuff like yeah, that as I well and controls your facial expression. Jaw like tension in my jaw. Uh-huh. And that was another thing that's been just gradually like alleviating to the point where I hardly feel anything now. Wow. Yeah. That seems incredible. That's yeah. a cool practice. Okay. Great ecotherapy tip there. Yeah. Wim Hof breathing. Yeah. Yeah, I had this like, feeling that like there are all these tension points in my body and as I was experiencing the world emotion and like um, embeddedness in the felt experience of the world if that makes sense couldn't flow through me because there are all these places where I was like feeling tension and so yeah. it's like these the, the experience of being in the world was trying to like flow through my body but it was like getting caught up in these places and so it was almost like I was uh, living in a haze you know and I still have that experience uh, but as I go through this process it feels like more and more of those layers of haziness are this is all like no, blue, blue is, stuff now this but is, i mean <laughs> you know it is but a little bit <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with that yeah there's nothing wrong no. with that. no and i think it's very rooted in vagus nerve stuff yeah and when you're speaking to that i'm like oh yeah life does seem a little more hazy than it used to mm. and i think that does have a lot to do with trap tensions in the body and whatnot mm. and like that shadow bag that you're talking about people carrying around it's like it's all that stuff so mm. it's it's a mix the shadow, bag. The shadow, shadow bag, bag, man. Yeah. The other thing about the shadow bag is that it takes more energy to keep that stuff pushed down in the right. bag than it does to actually pull it out and reintegrate it. Right. It's, it's scary. scary to reintegrate it because a lot of times what when we those parts of ourselves remain at the maturity level that they were when they were shoved into the bag. Like sometimes for, for many people, like it's their sexuality that's in there or their erotic vitality of the world, like being in the world. Um, or their rage. For me, I feel like it's maybe my rage is sometimes <laughs> is in the bag still. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so it's scary to pull it out because it's like, what is this wild thing that I right. have taken out and I'm now trying to make part of me? Totally. But once it's back in there, then you have that like energy restored. Exactly. You're made able to be a full, full person, basically. Yeah. And it's like yeah. it's good to be gentle with oneself around that stuff and like know that it was a defense mechanism. Mm to put that in the bag and mm -hmm. to be like that's okay that helped me survive now and now i'm good um no not really but i know of him yeah. i know of him you recommend him oh yeah yeah I'm reading his book it was interesting because i read his book soulcraft sort of before a more like momentous dip into the underworld yeah what i described of the last six months or so and now i'm reading his more recent book wild mind yeah and it's just it's just so like descriptive of this whole process and like, Dope. kind of has a lot of tools to navigate this underworld space in addition to the ones that I have been describing. Yeah. Um, talks about shadow work and different aspects of yourself. Just like you're saying, there's like this uh, 
he calls it the loyal soldier, the loyal soldier um, that as we're growing up, we form this identity that helps to protect us from actually being hurt in the world emotionally or physically, and that's our loyal soldier. And um, we make it to adulthood, and a lot of times our loyal soldier is still active, even though the war of becoming an adult, of like making it to childhood, is over. And he likes it to this, the reason he calls it the loyal soldier is because um, there were these soldiers in Japan after World War II, I think, who um, were lost on these islands mm -hmm. for like 30 or 40 years. And they thought for that whole time that the war was still going. Oh, no way. And okay. eventually they found them, uh -huh. you know, like taking pot shots at like civilians <laughs> from the <laughs> woods or whatever. Uh -huh. They brought them back to society and the process of reintegrating them is like kind of the process he describes of how to cope with these survival strategies that we have deployed. As we were growing up. That's a beautiful, and that's Bill Plotkin's book called Soulcraft. Soulcraft is so really good, him. and that describes okay. that process in there, and also the one I'm reading now is Wild Mind, which Wild describes Mind's the a newer one. four different aspects of ourselves and okay. the, the different sub. There, there's like four healthy personalities that he associates okay. with the north, south, east, and west aspects of ourselves. Okay. And well, we'll recommend unhealthy. that to people so that they yeah, can, yeah, okay. they can check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so many, so many amazing sources. So, yeah, that's that's a great source. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thanks for talking, dude. Yeah, this was, this was kind of a cool conversation. Yeah, absolutely. We always have good conversations. We always do have good conversations. <laughs> and that's why I do this, is like sit down with my homies and basically just chop it up. Yeah, chop so, it up. So it's kind of interviewy sometimes, but it's like, it's good to just <laughs> chat too and Next Catch time up. we'll just be doing some gardening holiday. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get a filmer for that. Yeah. We'll get into that. Cool, man. <laughs> like you ask a good question while you're pulling a berry off the tree. Exactly. Or... Whatever it is that you do, you pull berries, you pull leaves pull off of, the tree. Yeah, was... leaves and berries and yeah, a little foraging stuff here yeah, and there. This was cool. Cool, man. Appreciate you. Yeah. All right. Air hug. Yeah, from, air from hug. Six foot distance. From a, yeah, we're totally six feet away from each other. <laughs> exactly. We measured it beforehand. Cool. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Whoever's out there, Josh Swinson. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Good Grief Network. Um, Instagram at Good Grief Network. Is that true? Uh, I believe so. I believe so. You don't run that Just, part. That's Sarah's <laughs> no, stuff. No, no, no. Sarah does All right. Check out yeah. Good Grief Network on Instagram and uh, on their website. And right. thank you so much. Signing off. Adios.